Oh, that is a ominous smile. Yep. Anyway, welcome back to Crit and Crit. I'm Sint. I'm Axion. And we are uh, going to be wrapping up our discussion of Mossflower by Brian Jakes while we continue playing through Undertale. Alpha Snow. Alpha Snow. So, now that we've been thoroughly derailed... We're drawing near the end of Undertale, though I don't think we'll finish it today. Uh, mostly because the last bits of the game are a bit longer than our episodes tend to go, and we only have the one discussion left. And the elevator's falling again. But, yeah, so that was ominous. Yep. Actually, I think it was going up. Just not under our control. Well, I like how you can't get back into it anymore. Yeah, it's kind of closed up on us. But, yeah, so... Someone who you've never spoken to before thinks they've met you. Sounds like someone's going a little crazy. Just a tad... But Which that seems is... to be a common thread among a lot of stories, bad guys. Yep, especially in Redwall. Like, I'm not sure I can think of a single one where the bad guy didn't have at least a little crazy moment. Well, I can't remember all of my Redwall off the top of my head at the moment. But from the ones that we've done recently, that is an extremely, uh, extremely common result. Let's, yeah, let's see, with Redwall, Clooney started going nuts whenever, like, the top to the tapestry came up because he started seeing visions of Martin. And Mariel, Kabul went crazy because of the bell. Now we're on uh, Mossflower and Sarmina keeps hearing water drip 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 and is utterly convinced that Gingivir is plotting against her even though the only thing he's plotting is I would like to not be in this jail cell and then he leaves and just does not look back but she's still convinced everybody's working against me there's water so much water dark and cold so, you know, perfectly well-adjusted, exactly what you want in your evil award. Yep. But, that's kind of a running thing. In almost every Redwall story, especially all the ones that we've already reviewed, the villain tends to fall apart at the end. We lost Asgore. Hi, Tario. TV Tropes, I'm going to invoke the dread name, has a word for this. Or a concept for this, rather. The Villainous Breakdown. where the bad guy realizes, either realizes that their plans cannot come to fruition and crumbles under this, the weight of this overwhelming truth, or becomes so distraught by their 
need to pursue their goals or in the case of many Redwall villains, their fear and paranoia of betrayal, defeat, or their personal bugbears, which in Sarmina's case is her fear of water. Okay, so unpopular opinion. I don't really like Toriel that much. Oh, I'd much prefer Asgore over Toriel. Like, the game goes out of its way to resent her as being the one in the right, but I, I don't think so. Yeah, I always feel bad for Asgore. Hi, Undead. But I think it also just goes in with the fact that, again, these are children's stories, and the overall message is that, you know, like, evil doesn't pay off. Because look what happens to you if you go evil. You become unstable, you're unpredictable, no one can trust you anymore, and you're ultimately going to bring about your own destruction, to the point where even those who once trusted you and you could trust implicitly are like, yeah, nah, man, I'm out of here. Like, look at Ashleg. Like, the smartest of her underlings who gets out the first chance he can, because, like, no, nah, this is not getting better. She has completely lost everything resembling a marble. I'm getting out of here before I die. And... I think he's like the only one of her of her uh, captains to survive. I think Undertale is actually a very appropriate game to be playing at this time because we can talk. I'm not going to play through it because I don't enjoy playing it, but we can talk about the genocide route in this very concept. Your character goes through the game absolutely brutally destroying everything in their path cleansing areas until they are dreadfully empty and killing all of these wonderful characters along the way. And also Toriel. And then you get to the end, you go through the absolute hell gauntlet that are Undyne and Sands. And then you get gutted by the real villain. Or you become their thrall. Yeah, so... I had a hard time with the genocide run, not because like the game was making me feel bad, but because of the Hell Gauntlet. I'm not that good at a lot of video games. I couldn't get past Undyne. But yeah, that's kind of in the same box. You, a character becomes f super villainous and they have this kind of association with another villainous personage and inevitably that comes back to bite them in the back. Because, like, a big part of the villainous arrangement, and especially, this kind of ties into the, to the discussion of the last episode with betrayal, and the general expectation of betrayal in the relationships between the villainous characters in, in Moss Flower, is that each of them is expecting betrayal because that's what they would do in the same position because they would Hi Because they would feel like since that's what they would do, they would they assume that's what their fellow villains would do.
So we end up with this cyclical situation where um where one person feels like if I was in the position of strength in this arrangement, I would stab the other in the back. And the other is like, well, I know if I know if I was in the position of strength, I would stab the other in the back, so I need to stab them first. And this is kind of... That just dovetails off of what we were talking about last time with the betrayal. Exactly, and that's kind of what I was going to... Why I'm... I'm kind of reiterating that because it is relevant to the to the discussion of the villainous breakdown is so common in Redwall stories is because the villains all feel this way and this expectation is so omnipresent for them. Um, it inevitably leads to a level of paranoia about every association with anyone else in the world that if you're not constantly on guard, you're going to eventually get backstabbed. And that kind of constant stress, that kind of, that constant need to be always on the defensive is such a strain on the mind that there's no way that it it's very easy to see how that could result in a mental breakdown. Well, and there's also this. You've definitely heard the saying before, absolute power corrupts absolutely. What this is meant to mean is the more power someone is given, the looser their grasp on morality tends to be because they find themselves above consequence. But if you take it a slightly different way, corrupt doesn't just mean I flout the rules. If your file, for example, is corrupted, that thing is completely broken beyond use. So the more power someone gets, the less grasp they have on objective reality because they're so detached from what everybody else has to experience. That could be a factor as well. And throw in individual quirks and issues, such as Sarmina's phobia of water or Gabul's obsession with the bell. Things like that would get emphasized by their already shaky mental state as a result of this obsession and constant stress and dread. Yeah, but the heroes rarely seem to have anything resembling this problem, which I think again goes into the whole uh, evil is bad for you message that Mudwally is most known for. And I'm not really sure what we're going to do from here, because as you said, the boss fight that we're probably not going to have enough to say about. Should we like pick up with the next book and just not finish the fastest run? I think we will finish this fight some other time. Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you in the next series. Where we'll, we'll deal with Rainbow Dude. Yep, we'll pick up from this spot in the fight next time, and uh, that'll mean we'll have to do a little bit of watching all those cutscenes between videos, but that's it won't be the first time we've had to do that. See you all next time. Bye.